Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dialogue Over Division. And today I have with me Bryce Waite. Bryce is with New World Precious Metals, and I like to have the guests introduce themselves rather than me putting words in their mouths. Bryce, I'll turn the mic to you, and if you could give us a bit of an introduction of who you are and where you are. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, here in Vancouver. Um, I've lived here all my life. I'm proud Canadian, always have been. And uh, well, maybe not recently with all the things that have been going on. But that aside, been pr fairly proud of who we are and what we what we were. Yeah. And um, I, I got into gold and silver a couple of years ago because uh, I I have been in geopolitics and um, macroeconomics, just kind of studying it as a hobby um, for basically most of my life. Um, I really care about you know what's happening around the world and what's happening to the people out in the world. And when I saw what was happening with the world and our financial system. Um, I got into gold and silver um, through an opportunity. So now I work with New World Precious Metals and uh, help people get precious metals into their, into their portfolio to help them protect their wealth that they've built up over their lifetime from all of the chaos and insanity that our illustrious leaders are bringing to our doorstep. Well, lots to unpack there and I hope <laughs> we could get through it. But one thing I try to remind guests that I have on is that Sometimes I think you you need to understand that p people are coming in at these conversations with not a lot of background. And mm -hmm. so maybe let's start from scratch here is if you could give us kind of a what like fiat precious m metals 101. Sure. Is that possible? So, yeah, absolutely. So let, let's just start with what is a economy okay an economy is a group of people transacting at scale right so every individual in the economy has money in their pocket right we have fiat no i can get that get to that in a sec um, but essentially what you're doing in an economy is doing a service or creating a product and exchanging it for money so that somebody else can take that money and do something else with it that they need so mm -hmm. fiat currency um, is a derivative of gold historically and what it is is an intermediary between um, people and resources or people and skills or people and products or people and whatever, right? So it's the intermediary between things. It's what we use to move things around in the economy. And fiat currency really came from, um, it, it's actually very old um, because the, the Roman Empire actually collapsed because they printed more than they had. And so back in the day, um, before we had fiat currency as we know it today, um, we had gold and silver. So we had a, a gold backed or a silver backed currency and we used gold and silver as an intermediary. And there's a really old quote um, that's um, gold is the currency of kings, silver is the currency of artisans, and debt is the currency of slaves. And as you might know, we are very much in debt these days. So um, what really happened back in the day is that we had people that were transacting with coins, right? Because that was a physical ability to move um, products around the economy um, and around the world and get what we needed, right? And so once we got to the modern era <clears throat> and they were able to do what's called, um, what's the name of that? It is called, I can't remember the name of the, the, finance, the financial system that we use now. Um, re, I, can't, I can't remember, it's on the tip of my tongue, I can't remember the name. Uh, but anyway, so, so fractional reserve, fractional reserve banking. So what that ba basically means is they have a set amount of assets and they can loan out um, multiples of that and only keep a certain percentage, which used to be 10%, then it was five, now it's like three or 4% or something of reserves on hand. So what that means basically is if the bank has a, a hundred billion in assets um, on their balance sheet, they only need to keep like five hundred million dollars in cash on hand for doing transactions. So back in 1929, there was a run on the banks, which basically meant everybody was like, "Hey, you owe me money. Give me my money." And the bank didn't have it, so there was a run on the bank. Right. So that's kind of a a, a, a soft overview of a vast history of finance. Okay. And then, but so then we've been, I think people have been hearing the importance of gold and silver and precious metals. So why is that important? And why did it become not the currency? And now it's, there's a bit of a comeback. So can you explain that? Yeah, so 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 you can ask yourself this, and ask yourself, and, and anybody watching this can ask themselves this as well. What makes something valuable? Well, Open question. Yeah, I think it's the the value you ascribe to it. Right, oh. but there's an agreement there. So yes. the only reason that any money is is valuable is the agreement that we have that I can take it and use it somewhere else. So so anytime you use a currency, USD, Canadian dollars, Brazilian rials. 
Chinese yuan, whatever it is, you're essentially betting on that currency that you can take it and use it somewhere else. Right? And so gold and silver, and the reason the gold and silver are precious and they're is because they're metal, they're physical things that cannot be easily duplicated, defrauded, and increased, right? So one of the the uh, the pushes behind Bitcoin, so my cat's piece note. So the, the reason that people like Bitcoin so much is because you can't defraud the system. Is There's there's a situation behind that. But the, the whole idea is that you can't um, create more of it easily. So you have a set amount of units that everybody can see that you can't just print more of, right? So um, Canada doubled our debt as an example. So now we have like $1.3 trillion of debt or whatever it is, right? So they've printed all of this money essentially out of, th of, of thin air. And this is the important part at interest, right? So every dollar that's in existence in the entire economy has been printed into existence, right? Because it's not gold backed anymore. And I'll get to that in a sec. So what that means basically is that you have all of this money, let's say there's this much money, right, that's floating around the economy, there's actually this much debt, because there's a, a percentage that's charged on whatever is printed that is owed generally to central banks, right? So sovereign, um, sovereign nation states, basically print money from central banks is, is kind of how it works in a, in a simplistic way to explain it. And what that means basically is that somebody has to lose because there isn't enough money in the economy to pay for all of the debt in the economy. So somebody loses, somebody has to go bankrupt, somebody has to lose for that to work out somehow, or it just collapses, which is kind of what we're facing now. And to bring it back to the, the point of precious metals, the reason that people like precious metals and why precious metals have been used historically all throughout human history is because it's real, it's physical, and it's very difficult to take it, right? It's very easy to push a button and move money to somewhere over there, or take it over here and put it in somebody's bank account over there or whatever. Instant. They can do that at any time. This is one of the reasons that they want central bank digital currencies. But you can't do that with precious metals because it's a physical asset that you have to have somewhere. Now, that also means it's illiquid in some ways because you have to move it around. You're like, hey, I want to do this transaction with a billion dollars in gold. I have to pick up this billion dollars of gold and move it over there and, and whatever. That's where the fiat system came from as banks basically said, hey, I've got this asset. I know you've got this asset. Why don't we just you know, move something on paper instead of moving, moving the physical asset. That was really the genesis of our modern financial system is an efficiency um, claim that like, hey, this is going to allow us to do transactions easier and faster and cheaper. And so the reason that precious metals are making a comeback is because the value of the US dollar, the value of our national currencies is going down because they're printing so much money. And so if you want to protect yourself from inflation, if you want to protect yourself from all of the other crazy nonsense that the gover government and, and corporations and banks are doing. Well, if I have the physical asset, you can't take that from me because I have it, right? And if you think about, and this is an important thing I, I, I like to mention, if you think about all of the gold in human history, okay? We're, we're talking like 5,000 plus years of history that people have been using gold and silver. All of that gold that humanity has ever mined is still in existence more or less today because a very small por portion of it is used for industrial purposes. So almost all of it is still a physical asset in somebody's bank account or in somebody's uh, coffers or vault or whatever. And that means that throughout history, so the collapse of the Roman Empire, the collapse of the Ming Dynasty and the, um, the Turco Empire, or whatever it was called, uh, the Ottoman Empire, somebody has always owned that gold. So once they take that gold out of that system and they move somewhere else, they have now, now have this asset, this true wealth that they can uh, leverage and invest in other things. And so that's typically what um, banks have used. And this is what the uh, gold banked banking system was up until <clears throat> technically 1971 um, when they when the US dollar went off of the gold standard completely but it really start the decline really started when the central bank system in 1913 was created um, with I can't remember the name of that um, place Jekyll Island or something so in 1939 there was the can't remember the act the name of the act um, but they created the the Federal Reserve System they also created the at the IRS at that time and in 1945 at the end of the war they created the Bretton Woods International Financing System for international trade and then 30 odd years later in 1971 they went off of the gold standard and and from that time we've seen a massive increase in debt and a massive decline in um, um, purchasing power for the people that are using the system because so much money has been printed. And that's kind of where we are now. Interesting. And so uh, a few questions here. So you said that gold has been, you know, we've been using it at 
probably at least in how we can record it over 5,000 years. Yep. But then without the gold standard since 1971, so just like not even 50 years yet. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and now, so we're at basically the end of the life cycle of the USD because of all of the money that they've been printing. So the, fi the, the, the fractional reserve banking system basically allows you to print almost 10 times the value of what you started with. Th think of it like this. So you give me $100, right? I go and put that in the bank. The bank loans that out. And if it's 10%, they can loan that out $90 and still hold on to that $10. Somebody yeah. takes that $90, they put it in the bank. The bank loans out 90% of that blah, 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 all the way down, you basically get about $900 or 900 and something dollars out of that $100 that we started with. Okay. That's what fractional reserve means. And so you have this massive increase in the amount of money that's flowing around the, the, the economy. That's why, you know, from, you know, 100 years ago, this is actually a really good example. So I went to a museum um, and in 1890, so 130 years ago, here in Vancouver, in Langley, you could buy a fully functional farm on 10 acres of land in Vancouver, more or less, like Langley, where I live. And that was uh, $1,300. $1,300 for 10 acres of land at a fully functioning farm. What would that cost you now? Millions. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so you, you said that the USD is at the end of its life cycle. And you explained Close, yeah. what. So what does that mean practically? So practically, so um, let me give you a good example. 1929 was the depression, right? What happened with that is that there was a massive inflation uh, increase in the amount of money sloshing around the um, the economy in a bad place. So like people would just like look at the stock market and be like, I'm investing on that one today. And like people just flooded the, the market with money. But after a while, if that money doesn't do anything valuable, it crashes. So if you invest, you know, a million dollars in a business and that business goes bankrupt, well, you lose that money, right? And so if I make all of these investments that are bad and I lose all of this money, well, what does that do? It, it pulls down the value of everything associated with it because now it's not producing anything. It's not, it's not doing anything because the economy is supposed to be a representation of what's actually happened in the economy. It's, it's so distorted now that it's really not. So we have the economy right now being propped up by basically NVIDIA, which I just saw a thing yesterday um, that NVIDIA is $2.7 trillion in value. That's bigger than the entire German stock market for one company. That's Okay, insane. so <laughs> what does that mean? What is NVIDIA? So NVIDIA is um, it, it, what was a graphics company. So they create and build and design uh, graphics cards. And so that technology um, is basically used for AI training. And so there was this AI revolution that's been happening. So their value skyrocketed because they have all this new technology. And they're also a semiconductor chips manufacturer. And semiconductors and chips are basically the lifeblood of modern Everything, everything that is an electronic device has a chip in it which is a, that's a semiconductor. And depending on the size and the complexity of that chip, that it will not run, it will not function properly without that. So basically anything after about a 1960s, 70s, 80s technology all has chips in it, right? So the, the chips are one of the most valuable things on the planet right now, and the vast majority of them come from TSMC in Taiwan, which is basically close to war with China right now. And if that, if that factory, which produces the vast majority of chips for the planet, ever stops producing in, in Taiwan for any amount of time, the, the global economy crashes overnight because there's so much of our supply chain that is dependent on it, it would be, it would be catastrophic, to put it lightly. And so you compared, uh, what was the name of that company? N Navi N NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Sorry, yeah. I wrote it quickly. To the German economy. Yeah. And so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, so one company, NVIDIA, is, is basically the same size as the German stock market, which is $2.5 trillion. And so we've got multiple massive companies called the Magnificent Seven that are basically propping up the economy now. They're all tech companies. So that's Google, Apple, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, not Intel. I can't remember the other three. Um, I can't remember the other three. It doesn't matter. Um, but anyways, these seven companies are the are, are like 30% or something of the value of the S&P 500 because they've gone so far. So uh, Microsoft and I can't remember the other ones. So you, you have all of these like seven companies that are pushing up the stock market. Most other places and areas in the economy are negative right now because of all of the money that's been printed. 
and all of the decline in the economy in general right now because we shut everything down in 2020 while a lot of small businesses went out of business, right? And if people aren't making money and they're not you know, doing something in the economy, it pulls down the spending power of the economy. And if you can't spend money that you don't have, well, you're not buying things either. And so there's, it's called a doom loop. And we're, we're pretty much at the beginning of that doom loop. Well, maybe not the beginning because we're kind of deep into it now because um, it started at, at, at COVID basically. <laughs> and so there was a, there was a massive decline. We came back up when we came out of COVID a little bit, but that was um, a fake, uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, a false false promise let's call it yeah. <laughs> because what's happening now is people are losing there's layoffs left and right massive companies laying people off there's been so many people so many uh, businesses that have closed We've got massive immigration that are like new people coming in looking for jobs so it's pr it's pushing down the value of labor and we don't have enough jobs to support all of these people and so what does that mean that's a recession hopefully it doesn't turn into a depression or a collapse but it could and so that's a big reason why gold and silver is making a comeback because people are recognizing that, hey, I need to protect my wealth that I've built up over my lifetime. You, you, everybody that watches this, you can ask yourself this as well. If I had, it, 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 can my um, portfolio and my financial future handle another 2007 where, you know, things fell off a cliff, you know, the great, great financial crisis. If that happened again, could my retirement or my finances survive that? And one of the ways that you can guarantee that they do is precious metals, because no matter what happens within the economy, at the value of that metal basically stays fairly even. And it's actually increased over time since the depression. <laughs> After the, the depression, we came out of the depression. Yeah, and you physically have it. Exactly. So uh, a couple things. It's interesting when you recognize how, the, like when you made that comparison to the German stock market and economy, because we hear a lot of how influential companies are. But then when you when you look at the actual numbers, it kind of gives it away for you. Of course, they're influential if they have more wealth than the the, com the country itself. And you compared uh, Nav NVIDIA to Germany. What would that look like compared to Canada? Um, so our economy is, I believe, $2 trillion. Or no, I think it's 1.5. I think our entire economy, Canadian economy, is $1.5 trillion. So you have one company. in the, You have multiple companies in the U.S., actually. All seven of these companies that I'm talking about, which are Tesla, Meta, Google, NVIDIA, Amazon, Microsoft, and... So those seven companies are all trillion dollar companies. So those seven companies basically that have more value than most of the rest of the planet in these seven companies. And so, um, do you know the word oligopoly? Yeah, yeah. I've heard it, but let's talk about it. Can, if, can you explain it? Uh, the, the, what it means? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So an oligopoly um, basically means that a control of an industry by a few players in the in that industry right. so a, a really easy simple good example is our telecoms industry there is rogers there is bell and there is telus that's it because they just bought because rogers just bought a shaw right and so they've basically made a situation through regulation and through leverage and control of the economy uh, of that industry that there's no new players anybody that comes up gets bought out by one of these one of these four companies and now so these four companies now three companies essentially set all the prices all the access and all of your ability to operate within that industry right mm -hmm. that is what an oligopoly is now within an oligopoly you have um, shareholders, you have people that own those companies, right? So um, a, a good example of this is BlackRock. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, three absolutely massive hedge funds. Each one of those is multi-trillion dollars. So these companies that I just mentioned, all, all of those companies are less than $3 trillion. So I think Apple's number one at $3 trillion or three point something trillion or whatever. So Vanguard and BlackRock each are about ten trillion dollars in assets, and they're essentially a hedge fund for the super ultra, super hyper cool wealthy people, right? They pooled all of their money, and BlackRock is the one of the the major shareholders of I think eighty percent or something of the Fortune five hundred. So what you have is the actual companies in the, in the economy. So like say you have these like five hundred um, companies in the economy, which is the 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 Fortune five hundred, the five hundred biggest companies in the economy, or that they they base that that index on. 
and then you have BlackRock that owns 10%, let's say, of all of them. <laughs> and so you have a, a massive amount of control that's outside of the normal ways of regulation, that's outside of the normal ways of control, that have a, a place on the board, they have in they have a say inside of what happens at the company. So all of this DEI, DEI garbage and ESG and all this nonsense basically comes from these super powerful hedge funds that are controlled by shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you invest in BlackRock, you're essentially investing in all of these other places right and what an oligarchy is and why i say this is that you have a group of people very powerful rich rich wealthy people in an economy that are making decisions for us the people outside of governments and because they essentially buy governments or government officials or scientists or companies or hedge funds or whatever but they basically get to say hey the golden rule is I got the gold, so I make the decisions. <laughs> I make the rules, is go the, the golden rule. And what we have now is a oligopoly, corporate, uh, corporatocracy, which is corporations making decisions for a, um, a, a, a society or a, or a country. And you have on top of that, an oligarchy that controls all of it. So that's kind of how I explain it. And so the reason that gold and silver is really important now, this is one of the reasons, is that um, central banks are buying huge, huge, huge amounts of gold, right? China, massive amounts of gold, all of the BRICS nations, which we can get into if you want, um, they're all buying gold and silver because they, they know that the US dollar is on its last legs. <laughs> and I can get into that too if you want. Well, yeah, I do want to get into a couple things, central banks a bit more and BRICS. But before we do, you mm -hmm. talked about, I, I think you said in Canada, it's $1.5 trillion. And can you explain what you mean when you say that number? Because And then you talked about assets in the corporation being in the $3 trillion. So, but those, that's not an apples to apples comparison, I think, right? Because countries you were saying earlier have a huge amount of debt and inflation and all on, on all that stuff that companies can't access and don't have. So can you just explain that a little bit more when you're looking at assets of a trillion dollar company versus Canada, for example? Sure. GD, so GDP is a little bit different from um, profit and loss. So like the the value, the stock value or the, the value of a company is based on their stock price. So that could mean anything. So like um, the perception of a company has a big impact on how much it's worth by the public and how many how much money is being put into it. So yeah. Tesla is a good example of that. Elon Musk comes out with a new thing. He's like, oh, wow, Cybertruck this and Cybertruck that. Full, full self-drive, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wow, I got to invest in that they you know spend a huge amounts of money in there it doubles the stock price so now the company's worth a billion or a trillion dollars instead of 500 billion gdp is a little bit different from that in the sense that it's based on actual numbers gdp is basically the goods and services of the country um i can't remember the um uh, the equation uh, what is it uh, measures the, um so there's the amount of assets that the, the the country has how much tax it takes in how much goods are produced there's an equation for it that i can't remember offhand. Yeah, yeah but it but it's it's more closer to reality than just perception which is what the stock value of a company is because okay. we've seen in the last like 20 years there was no trillion dollar companies now there's like seven right that's a very that's a vast increase in the amount of money sloshing around the um the economy and where it's gone and where it's where it's landed. So people like betting on sure things. And when you have a company, let's give an example of Microsoft, because almost everybody has a computer and almost everybody has either Apple or Microsoft on their computers, right? So you have a huge amount of market pen penetration, value to customers, cash flow, and control over certain things. So people are like, hey, that's something that is really a, a good bet and a long-term safe bet. And so that's a good stock for, for people people to pick as an example. Now, I don't believe that personally for a variety of reasons, but a lot of people look at it in that way. And so the difference in a stock market is how much is in that stock market total. So you have certain companies listed on certain stock markets. So we used to have the VSX in Vancouver. There was a lot of mining companies here. The VS VSX was shut down because there was so much fraud and nonsense happening. They're like, you know what, screw it, we're shutting it down. So now we have the TSX, which is the Toronto Stock Exchange. There is the, uh, the NSX, 
not the NSX. What is it called in New York? The New York Stock Exchange? Yeah, it is the NSX. Um, there's the Nikkei in um, Japan. There is one, in, there's Shanghai Exchange or the Hong Kong Exchange, one of the two. And there's a couple others around the world. And usually it's only um, very significant companies, companies, countries that have their own stock exchange. And so how many companies are listed on that stock exchange basically tells you how much money is in that stock exchange. So Canada is, is considerably smaller than the US. Obviously, we're a smaller a smaller um, country. And so the value, the, the total value of that exchange compared to a company itself is maybe not super significant, but interesting in the fact that you have companies that are worth as much as groups of companies now. Whereas before um, the gold standard, you would have a very significantly lower valuations of companies and you got to think too that like exxon mobile one of the largest companies on the planet in in terms of footprint and and physical assets was is worth significantly less than microsoft majority just tech and software right and the reason that the magnificent magnificent seven are what they are is because they're all tech companies so you have a a much lower bar for the cost of development of something and a much higher degree of market penetration that doesn't require logistics. It mm -hmm. just takes logistics, time, physicality to move oil from out of the ground from one place to another and, and modify it and send it wherever it's got to go than it does to push a button and send Microsoft across the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a much more efficient system of moving ideas and um, intellectual property around so it can be much more efficient become much more profitable which is why we've seen this massive increase in the magnificent seven because they can just go anywhere very easily and that's what they've done and you could describe the value you want to that and that's what's been going on too yeah in the Okay. Yeah, and so when we had um, the, the tech bubble in 2001, as an example, so you had all of these companies essentially riding that wave of the internet's new and cool and we got to do amazing things with it and everything was just going everywhere. And then when they they had their initial idea, we're going to sell this thing in this way to these people and we need this many things and this many doodads and whatever. But then when they didn't hit those numbers, whatever they were, and they weren't actually making money and they invested all this money and it didn't go anywhere, everything collapsed because they're like, mm -hmm. hey, the money just wasn't there. Same thing happened with the green revolution same thing happened in um what was the other one cryptocurrency and you could see like hey bitcoin was new and cool and then we had ethereum and then we had you know a, literally a thousand what they're called shit coins um that just had no value Are they and, now sorry they're called shit coins now oh yeah you never heard that yeah yeah so so like <laughs> dogecoin as an example it was like yeah. oh doge this and you know elon musk made a tweet about it and he made people a bajillion dollars because he said something about it right but there was no actual value in those coins in any different different meaningful way than a bunch of other coins that somebody just wrote a white paper and said mine's new and cool and it could do cool stuff and they basically invested in it as a um as an investment rather than something that was valuable so bitcoin was the original ethereum was a significant difference and a technical difference and there's a lot of value in ethereum and their network for that reason but a lot of the other ones were just carbon copies of other garbage that really had no value and they just had a different name so mm -hmm. there's some that had technical differences but there was a whole bunch that didn't and they all died and there was a whole bunch of rug pulls and scams and nonsense so if anybody wants to look into this uh, coffeezilla on youtube has just a, a, a basically a huge um catalog of all of these fools making ridiculous nonsense <laughs> okay. yeah interesting i had it well i'm not that in the know with this but now i am <laughs> and before we move on though because i want to really focus on canada like you know sure. so that people have a better understanding i think one thing we hear at least if you have an opportunity to to hear our DM, yeah, Freeland talking about <laughs> it's very hard sometimes to listen, but she talks about the triple A credit mm. rating for Canada. So, can we get into that a little bit and yeah. help explain that? Um, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll preface this with the example that's really good that every, that most people will know is the, the the global financial crisis. So the global financial crisis in 2007, the way that that happened was um, cataloged in the movie uh, The Big Short, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in that movie, they had essentially what were mortgage-backed securities, right? So you have a mortgage that's paying a certain amount of money every month, and the bank looks at that and says, this mortgage is a good mortgage. So there's a triple A credit rating mortgage. So the person has um, a high credit rating, makes good money, pays every month, no delinquencies. They, they look at a bunch of different things in that in their equation, say, this is a good one. 
Now, on a, a step down, they have a double A, right, which is slightly worse in various different numbers. They have a, a, a single A, a B, a C, and essentially garbage. B basically below, I think, A or B or something is basically garbage, right? And essentially what they were doing is they were taking the triple A rated stuff, they were taking the B rated stuff, they were taking the C and the garbage and packaging it together and selling those to other institutions as triple A. So instead of, so when you're investing in something, you're like, hey, you need to pay me more money because there's more risk here, right? So that, mm -hmm. that garbage stuff at the bottom, they're like, no, you got to pay me like 10% or something as opposed to 1% because there's more risk. So I'm going to give you the money, but you're going to pay me more because I'm taking more risk, right? That's mm -hmm. generally how that works. And so what they were doing is they were packaging all of this stuff together, patching it as AAA and selling it as as pristine stuff which it wasn't and so when those um, mortgages started to fail because people lost their job and they couldn't pay and there's delinquencies and they stopped stopped paying their mortgages right it collapsed the value of those um those mortgage-backed securities and it collapsed the the financial economy um uh, and and banks so like bear stearns and goldman sachs and all these guys that were massively invested in this because they were making so much money off of it and so what happened with that <clears throat> is that they took the um, the amount of money that they had and they repackaged it with stuff they shouldn't have and resold it to somebody for a profit. Okay. Now that's the basics. Okay. And so when you have a triple A credit rating, which, um, the, the U S just got downgraded from triple A as well because of their debt. Uh, China's actually been downgraded a bunch of times now because nobody thinks they can repay their debt either. Um, you have a, you be, you basically get really good rates. So at the, at the top of the, the AAA credit rating, you get good rates and you're able to get debt financing for whatever you have. Okay. So if you get downgraded, you now get worse rates and you're more of a risk. So everybody looks at that and be like, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. So Christia Freeling keeps talking about this because it's basically one of the only positive indicators Canada has, even though we've doubled our debt. And she seems to keep forgetting this point or maybe not forgetting, it just doesn't talk about it, but they doubled our debt. Right. So we were in, in uh, 2007 when the, the, the GFC was happening, we were in a, fi a decent financial position because our debt to GDP ratio, which is a very important number, is very low. I think at that point it was like like 50 percent or 60 percent or something like that. That was really good, much better than the Americans, much better than most of the rest of the planet, to be honest. Now, our GDP ratio, GDP to debt ratio is, I think, um, almost, I think it's just over 100% now. And there's this this theoretical limit of 130% that once that you hit that number, you're essentially bankrupt or insolvent, that you will never be able to pay that debt back because the interest payments on the debt that you, that you have acc uh, accrued over yeah. time now supersedes the amount of tax income that you get. And so the Americans are, are now at, a, at a, a essentially $1 trillion a year, more or less, that they're paying on the interest of all of their debt. And they only bring in $5 trillion in tax revenue or, or revenue every year. That's very bad, right? And in Canada, to bring it back to Canada, we now pay more for our debt than how much we spend on healthcare, how much we spend on uh, the military, and how much we get in GST. So all of the GST that everybody pays every single day and every single year, we are now paying all of that GST money just to service debt. That's how incompetent and bad Christia Freeland is at her job. So let's get into this a little bit. Who are we paying the debt to and how do you get downgraded? Like who is making these decisions? Great questions. So, so who are we paying this debt to? Right. So that is a great question. One of the fundamental questions of the economy. So when you print money as a sovereign nation, essentially what happens is this, the, the, the bank or the, the usually the treasury essentially creates a treasury note and goes to the central bank that that um, that funds it essentially so they go to the central bank and they say hey give us give us this much money and they're like all right we print a bunch of bonds out and those bonds have to be bought by somebody so there's a bond market that's kind of the underpinning of the economy now I'm not super technical on this aspect of the economy I have a general understanding of how it works and what that means basically is that the government is like hey I need more money I'm going to go to the central bank which is a private entity by the way it's not a sovereign um, so sovereign entity and the uh, the central bank gives us that money you know, through bonds and they charge an interest on it. So um, generally how it works is there's a percentage on the bonds that give a return. So at the end of it, you have, it's like a 2% bond, let's say. And so at the end of the term, usually five or 10 year bonds or treasuries, um, that is the amount that you get paid out. And you can sell that um, during that time for, for liquidity. So if you have to sell it to somebody else, you generally spend, hey, I'm going to give you this much and you'll, you'll get more at the end. Is that right? 
That might not be right. I, I can't I can't remember if it, if it's the opposite of that. But the general the, the general overview is that the bond is there. It has a, a face value no. and then it has a a, a a market value because if nobody's willing to buy it, it, doesn't matter how much it says on it. I'm not willing to pay it. And that's essentially what happened with SVB last year when it collapsed because they had all this bonds that were now not market value and they had to sell them at a loss. So they lost billions of dollars. That's what collapsed the bank and started that whole process. And so bonds is a very important part of the the economy and we get basically all of our money from central banks that's why yeah the central banks are a problem and so the, what was the second question they asked um the the grading the downgrade downgrading who decides it yeah so there is so that's actually a very opaque system <clears throat> so there's moody's there's uh the main one that i i can remember is moody's but they're essentially a private institution um, that dictates what it is. So they look at a whole bunch of different factors. There's a process to it. I'm sure it's very involved and regulated and whatever. But ultimately, somebody is making a decision that now this country is not as reliable or as solvent as it was for whatever reason. So what is that process? I don't know. Yeah. Who does it? I don't know. Uh, but the, the, the main fact of the matter is, is that somebody does it and somebody yeah. gets to decide how much value your country has based on whatever system that they're using. And so that can go up and that can go down. But we've been basically in the West had a AAA credit rating for the majority of the existence of this system um, because we were in a fairly good financial position. So the, the USD is the global reserve currency. So it ha that, that gives the, the USD a huge amount of power with um, how it works in the global economy because it's a reserve. But they've basically made... So US Treasuries was basically a tier one asset. So that was the the top line of revenue, not revenue, of value that 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 people could invest in as an institution. Like they would hold, like, so other central banks would hold U.S. treasuries as a asset to, to, um, to prop up their balance sheet. So if they were doing whatever they were doing in their own currency, they would hold U.S. treasuries as a backstop to their currency. So they could be like, hey, we've got this um, asset on our books that gives us this value that we're saying we're working with. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to like simplify this as much as possible. But the, the ultimate point is that this asset has a value. And it's a pristine value because it's AAA and it's it's universal. And if I needed to sell it, I could. So it's liquid, right? Yeah. And when and now because the value of the U.S. dollar, value of U.S. Treasuries is declining, they have to give people more uh, more return on them. So the increase of ten uh, U.S. Treasuries that are ten-year treasuries that uh, that has gone up significantly because there's less people willing to buy them because there's so much debt and like who is buying trillions of dollars of U.S. debt? There isn't a lot of people on the planet that can make those types of purchases, right? Yeah. And so the 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 market for these these asset classes is going down. The value of them is going down, and BRICS is trying to get away from the, the under the thumb of the U.S. dollar system, the SWIFT system. And what that means basically is that for us, because we are connected at the hip to the U.S. dollar, is the Canadian dollar is also getting hammered all across various different areas of the economy because mm -hmm. we're not being financially prudent like we historically have been. Like Canadians historically have been very conservative, very prudent, very defensive of what we do we're very conservative from an investment point of view just in general um as a country justin trudeau and freeland have just obliterated that <laughs> double tap to the back of the head out, out, out back behind the shed um so what we're dealing with now is that the investment in canada has gone down significantly our inflation has gone up various different other things that are bad for the economy and it's getting worse because not only are we going in the wrong direction they're accelerating that decline interesting so like what i've really come to understand which i didn't really um appreciate before is how much influence in some unknown individuals have on our country's economy hmm. and if our country isn't strong in protecting like you use the word conservative but i think that it's more uh, and people, that term I just don't like anymore because it's used for everything. And one of our federal major political parties is called the Conservative Party. Yep. And uh, people ascribe their understanding of that. But really, it's conservative in terms of uh, conservative in nature, in terms of I how can how can you is there a word that you could use to describe how Canada was managing itself and not using that word just yeah. because I, I want to get into that a little bit more 
Yeah, maybe defensive and prudence would be prudence. synonyms for that. Yeah. Like, so, like that. So, so like the old sense, of, the old way that conservative was used was like fiscal conservative, right? Yes. Yeah, fiscal liberal, right? Which denotes basically how you were spending money on how you managed money, right? So Canada historically has been a very um, slow moving entity where an investment. So we really looked at things. We really analyzed things. We really did a lot of due diligence in what we were doing up until we had all these communist lunatics on the left, like destroying everything that they touch. Right. And, and so typically conservatives were the people that managed money in that way. And yeah. liberals were the ones that were like, Hey, let's spend to do things and accomplish things for social good and stuff. And, and like, I understand the reasoning behind that. But if, like I was saying um, earlier about the economy, if you throw a whole bunch of money that doesn't do anything valuable in an economy well it's it, it it's an investment that failed right or it's, yeah. it's it has to accomplish so, so there's this word that they throw around a, a lot called or, or saying that they throw throw around a lot called value for money right so if i give you money or i put money somewhere what is the value that i got out of it right? yeah that's the question that we're supposed to be answering with whatever that is so if i give you know a bajillion dollars to gender studies what is the value that i got out of that that process right if i give a billion dollars to another country what did that get us if i invested a billion dollars in mining, what did that get us, right? And so what we're really kind of facing now is that we've spent ungodly amounts of money, and I'm not exaggerating, they printed $650 billion, okay? What did we get for this money? We've got now higher inflation, we've got people that have to go to food banks, we've got massive inflation, We, I could go on and on and on with yeah. the problems that have been caused. But one of the things that you have to consider and really think about is where did this money go? Whose bank account did it, was that money put into and what did they do with it, right? Because yeah. I know just from the Arrive Scam debacle and, and the dozens of other examples that some of that was fraud. <laughs> some of yeah. that was stolen. Some of that was poorly used and some of that was inefficiently used, right? And so we as a society, just in general, because we, we've been so lucky, I think, in, in, in history, in human history, you really got to think that Canada is exceptionally lucky with a, where we are geographically on the planet, B, the society that we grew up in, and um, C, the environment that we that we grew up in as the advancement of our culture and economy and country, right? We, we, we're beside the, the biggest military in all of human history as an ally, so we don't have to worry about being invaded, ever. We're surrounded on three sides by, a, um, <laughs> by an ocean, and we have unlimited resources of energy and mining. So, like, we have... All of the things necessary to have this unbelievably amazing superpower of a country and we're being run by absolute lunatics yeah well and one thing that i tried to remind people of too and it's another way of looking at what you're saying is and i appreciate that you said that canada has been run so prudently because i think that helped to bring canada to the comfortable nature that it was yep. because it it was conserving things it was preparing it was being diligent with diligent, its yeah. econ economy so if you're not prudent you can't do any of the things the social um justice things that ultimately sure let's get into that at some point but you have to have the money to support it and yeah. this is where I think uh, sometimes we just don't have the conversation. Sure, people, obviously, who doesn't want to have a clean environment and clean water? Like, let's just stop there for one second. It's not a conservative or a liberal issue. In order to survive, we all need clean water and clean air. Mm -hmm. But in order to advance that, uh, advance and put technology into it, you have to have the money to do it. So, and we were in that situation because of the prudency. And I didn't appreciate that before, how prudent we were and how easily I think it is to manipulate a country uh, if there's just some personal private interests that have such a big influence on a country. So that's very interesting that I haven't really considered. Um, I do really want to talk about central banks as well, too. And who they are, where they came from, and why they have so much influence as well. <laughs> sure. And um, then lastly, too, so I don't forget, and it might tie into your uh, response, is why they're coming back to gold and what that means. 
Yes, absolutely. C central banks um, come from the uh, the Federal Reserve system. O old money back in the day, uh, like old Europe, this is all like aristocracy and people. And so the Rothschilds were the essentially the progenitors of the modern uh, central banking system. So what you have in a central bank is basically an unlimited checkbook that you can just go to and like, give me the money that I want. So it, think, think of a fat kid in a candy store that's like uh, i've got a massive addiction to sugar and you just put them in a candy store right so all governments want to do whatever they want to do to hold on power and they're like hey i gotta spend money over here for this person this person needs whatever they need and that you know province or whatever needs this for roads and whatever but we don't have enough money well I'll print it into existence right so you've essentially given um sovereign states um the ability to have a unlimited checking account um, that they can just dive into as much as they want. Christia Freeland actually is just trying to raise our debt limit to two, $2.1 trillion because she intends to hit $1.8 trillion, which is what it currently is at. It's just absolute insanity. And, and what this basically means is that you have all of this debt that's loaned at interest to us, the people, that we don't control, that we have no say over. We have Nobody has ever talked to anybody in Canada be like, hey, should we print $600 billion into existence and do stuff with it? Nobody said yes to that. That wasn't on uh, when we had an election last time. Nobody was saying about that. Nobody was talking about all these authoritarian policies, but they did it because our, our you know, um, political system is really obsolete from where we are today or from the from the things that we have to deal with today. And we can get into that, too, if you want. But the, the, ultimately, the central banks essentially control monetary policy. Right. So the, the Canadian central bank, I can't remember the guy's name that runs it right now, but we're running at a loss right now. So the central bank is losing money. Well, who pays for that? We do. So if we make money. Uh, if the central bank makes money, they pay the government, right? So the, the, the central bank acts as an intermediary and a authority over financial policy in a country. So in the U.S., the Federal Reserve is not a sovereign entity. It is controlled mm -hmm. and owned by private banks, J.P. Morgan and all the other banks. They're all um, shareholders and um, on the boards of directors of all of these different banks. But ultimately, all of these places and all of these banks and all of these institutions, they all have private money, which is where the buck stops. So when you have, let, let's say you owe somebody a thousand dollars, right? You have a say technically over like, Hey, you owe me money. Right. Yeah. But if, if, and there's this old saying that if you owe somebody a little bit of money, that's your problem. If you, or sorry, that's their problem. If you owe somebody a lot of money, that's your problem. So, cause like, how are you going to collect a billion dollars for somebody that doesn't have it, any money? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. lose. You loan it out poorly, right? And so what you have basically is is this this thing that's happening all across the world now, where sovereign nations are getting massively, massively, massively in debt to central banks. Well, what happens if the sovereign state can't can't pay anymore? That currency collapses, and that's what's happened multiple times. So that happened in Sri Lanka, happened in Zimbabwe. It's happened all throughout history. There's been thousands of currencies over history that have collapsed. And, and that's, then what and that's happens? where we're going. Uh, yes. What's the next step? The next step after a currency collapse is the destruction or the um, the collapse of the, of the economy. So in Weimar Germany, this is a really good example. So Weimar Germany, just before World War One, um, they had ma sorry after World War One. After World War One, they had massive inflation where they had trillions of dollars or trillions of of marks. Um, they were called that were essentially worthless. So you'd have these images of people shoveling money into the fire because it, it literally wasn't worth the, pra the paper it was printed on. And so to get out of that, they basically had to create a new currency. Originally, they used um, industrial assets, but eventually they went to a gold and a silver standard. And that was where Hitler rose to power. And the same thing more or less happened at the beginning of the U.S. dollar or the, U the U.S. currency where they when they broke away from Britain, they were like, hey, we need our own currency. They tried a bunch of different ways. It didn't work. They tried industrial assets, didn't work. And eventually they got a, on a silver and then a gold standard and that stabilized everything. And so mm -hmm. they had a nationalized national bank that was co controlled by the country and by the people. And Congress had, I think it was Congress that had um, authority over it. And so you had the people of the country and the people that were supposed to represent the country in control of monetary policy and mm -hmm. the central banks have taken that um, power and control and authority and responsibility away from the sovereign states and put it into private hands is essentially what a central bank is and and so did the countries just say hey help us out or did the, the central banks say come in and say like hey we have money you need us <laughs> Yes, they, yeah. they literally came in with their sleazy, slimy, snake oil salesman style 
And they were like, hey, we got a bunch of money for you. You totally want a central bank, don't you? And they're like, no, we don't. Like, no, you actually do want a central bank. And basically, they have funded both sides of the um, the American <laughs> political parties, just as they do in every country. The central bank and the, the bankers in general fund everybody because they're like, we want this policy. You're going to put this policy down. And that's why um, lobbying, uh, I absolutely just despise lobbying because it's literally legalized bribery how does it make sense for anybody to ever say hey if you spend a bunch of money with me i'll put your legislation through that's insane <laughs> yeah well except and i totally agree with you but what i'm trying to help canadians realize is they all have the power to lobby like that's yeah. called civic engagement and yes. they're just not doing it at all so no. like they have more of that power because they don't actually have to spend money to do it they just have to get like a hundred, five hundred people to agree with them, and then they have the power of the polls and the people, or a thousand people or ten thousand people. But anyway, that's something very interesting. And I do want to because I try to wrap it up around sixty minutes mm -hmm. or so. But I did want to touch on BRICS a little bit too. And then you said the other system that is are in place because BRICS is the new one, mm -hmm. uh, and I forgot the acronym for the old one. So maybe if you could just give us the old one and what that is, and compare that to BRICS and what that is. The old uh, central bank system. Yeah, uh, like the currency thing. There was the acronym you used. Um, the it was an S, I think. No. Fractional Reserve, fractional brick system. Well, just maybe talk about the bricks, and then if it's something that I remember, or you might just go into it anyway. Well, here, so I'll, I'll, I'll connect this and I'll kind of wrap this up and, and give you kind of an overview of what's happening and why it's happening and where we're going, unless we change the direction because it's really bad. Okay. Perfect. So you, yeah. So, let's do so, that. So, yeah. You asked about you know what's next after a collapse. Well, I'll I'll get to exactly that because that is what's coming. The BRICS nations, the 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 genesis of this idea really came out of the war. Well, it's been happening for a while. But the, the the increase in speed, the acceleration of the BRICS nations system really came when Russia invaded um, Ukraine and the Americans used the nuclear option to sanction Russia and seize their assets. The SWIFT system, which is the intermediary. Swift. That, that Swift. was it. Yeah. So the SWIFT system is a technical um, system that was created that is, is essentially bank to bank transfers and a communication system. So if I send you know, whatever to another bank, they use the SWIFT system to make sure and verify and, and clarify what that transaction is, who it comes from, whose account it's going to, and all of the information is essentially this little packet of information that goes from one bank to another, right? That's what right. the SWIFT system is so that we can make these international transactions like this, right? And so the BRICS is basically building a competitor to that system where they don't have to use the US dollar. And the reason that the US dollar is the power that it is right now, even though it's not on the gold standards, in 1971, 1972, when they got off of the gold standard, they sent in Kissinger to Saudi Arabia and they made a deal with the Saudis and OPEC. They were like, hey, you guys are going to um, price all oil and all oil sales in US dollars, which created the petrodollar. So you have this essentially synthetic demand for US dollars because you had to use US dollars to buy oil. You want oil and fuel, you have US dollars, period. So that was kind of like the the goal. That was the the oil, right? Sort of, yeah. Interesting. So be, okay. Yes. Yeah, so because they didn't have gold backing the the, the currency yeah. anymore, they needed something else because yes. otherwise inflation would just skyrocket and it would destroy the dollar. So they got the U.S. dollar off of um, the gold standard and they essentially put it onto the oil standard, which is like if you want oil, which you have to in a modern economy, you have to sell it or buy it in U.S. dollars. So everybody had to have U.S. dollars on their bank account and use in their transactions. And it grew to something in the neighborhood of like 70 or 80 percent of global trans international transactions because wow. it was an intermediary. So if I'm like Zimbabwe or something and I want to trade with China. Do I want Zimbabwean, whatever the hell they are, or yuan, or can I just get US dollars that I have anyway, and then use that for my international transactions? Yeah. So it was just a more efficient option for the vast majority of com uh, countries because the US dollar was secure, standard, and it had the US military, you know, stomping around the planet, making sure that everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing and knocking people out if they needed it. <laughs> so not, I'm not supporting that because I don't, but I'm just saying that's what happened, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so what BRICS is trying to do is, is get around that system and have a basket of currencies or at least a 
of at the very least a system so that they can use their own currencies for transactions so russia and china are the big par parts of BRICS, right so there's the chinese economy the chinese yuan they have a digital yuan that they're that they're pushing out right now um and they want to be able to use their currency instead of the u.s dollar for international transaction now that's already happening for a lot of places saudi arabia included so they've already had transaction in um oil sales that are not u.s dollar denominated which is why i was saying the u.s dollar is on its last legs in mm -hmm. a variety of different ways for a variety of reasons those are two of the big ones so what the goal is right is the ultimate goal now now everything that i've said over this entire interview this is the most important thing okay so the ultimate goal of all of the central banks is a central bank digital currency cbdc okay so I, I highly recommend everybody go and look at this. George Gammon on YouTube, he does a really good. I'll, I'll even I'll even send you the, um, the the link to this that explains exactly what this is, exactly how it works, and exactly why it's the the worst thing in human history. Because essentially, what it does is it allows the central bank to see all transactions that you do. It allows them to control where where you spend your money, what you spend your money on, who you spend it with, and whether or not you can do the transaction at all. So let's say that they give us a social credit system with um, uh, carbon credit. So a carbon credit social credit system, um, they can connect that to the central bank digital currency and say, hey, you bought a lot of meat this month. You're not allowed to buy any more meat anymore. Boop. And now you can't transact. Well, to, 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 to connect that, you have to have a digital ID. And so the, what I like to talk publicly about when I, when I speak publicly is there's four things that they're trying to push forward. Central bank digital currencies, digital IDs, microchips in your hand, and 15-minute cities. So those four things are the four pillars of enslavement of humanity. And if all four of them go in, everybody is a slave forever. You will never be able to escape that system. So that's why I push back on it. Edmonton, literally the other day, started talking about 15-minute cities. So My city. Your city, exactly. And so, and so the ultimate goal is central bank digital currencies because they will have ultimate control and force people to buy stuff or restrict people to buy anything that they want at any time that they want. And they can also force people to use that currency. So you'd never be able to save up for a house. You'd never be able to keep um, money in your pocket because they could tax it. So you would have to spend it and continue to push the economy forward under what they want you to do. So the central bank digital currency is the absolute worst thing that I can imagine for anybody. And what when you asked me earlier about collapse that's what will happen after the collapse because they're like oh hey you guys really screwed up your sovereign currency your sovereign currency is worthless now well here we've got a solution for you just sign up for this central bank digital currency and it'll all be good all you need is a digital id and all you need is a microchip in your hand to use it and all you need is to live in a 15 minute city and you're gonna be good but then you're a total slave so mm -hmm. don't do that <laughs> so does bricks prevent that or no. is it part of it no, it doesn't prevent it per se, but what I think is happening ultimately is they want to crash the, the Western economies first and and roll out this system so that everybody's essentially a slave, and then they'll essentially do the same thing to the, the Eastern countries. Because the, the, we have the Western oligarchies, and you have the Eastern authoritarians, right? So the Chinese Communist Party is about the worst group of people on the planet in all of human history. They're absolutely diabolical. They want world domination. They are not nice about anything that they do ever, right? So uh, I will I will never bow down to those lunatics ever. But um, they want the same thing. They want absolute control over other people, uh, other countries' economy as well. So, you know, China is, <laughs> for better or for worse, trying to push their economy and control all over the world. So the... Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, um, that was a big effort to get their currency and control over assets in other countries, similar to what the U.S. has done for decades for um, subversion and uh, what's the other word? Uh, colonialization, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's essentially using their currency and assets and control in other countries to affect goals and, and, and change in a country. But uh, the Chinese are very overt about it. They're like, hey, give us give us your stuff because you owe us a bunch of money. And that's what the BRI really, really did. It's it's kind of on its last legs right now because they're so bad at building things. But ultimately, there's still debt and there's still money moving around. And so what we've basically got is now a war with the West and the East uh, for dominance over the future of, of, of humanity through financial and military means. So we're, we're, we're already at war um, from an economic standpoint, and the war is already 
going kinetic with Russia. Like they're talking about, like Russia has nukes on their border of, of Russia that are, are of Ukraine that are armed and ready to go. <laughs> so we're like, we're so close to a nuclear war that it's, it, it's lunacy. And this is another reason that people are starting to notice that, Hey, these things are happening and I need to protect myself. And one of the few things that you really have to do to protect yourself truly is gold and silver. Right? So when I talk about this stuff, I really recommend people food is the number one thing. If you don't have a lot of money, don't worry about gold and silver, go and get food and, and store it and have it in a way that you can store it for a long time like 90 days minimum of food just go and get 90 days worth of food because at sooner or later sooner or later everybody the normies around the world are going to notice like hey i need hard assets that are actually going to be in my control that are going to benefit me long term and i got to protect my family and when that happens i can tell you right now you can put my name beside this as a prediction it will be chaos and it will not be good for a lot of people so when I, I like to tell people if if you see this and you're worried about what's happening in the world, go and get enough food for you and your family for minimum 90 days. I would say even a year at this point, because if we have a, a truly epic war of World War Three, like I, I think is going to happen, which I think we're on the trajectory of people aren't going to be farming. Right. And if farmers stop farming, no food is created and a lot of people are going to die. Right. We're kind of lucky in Canada that we're so um, energy and, and food and, and various things rich. But like like we both said, we're run by absolute children. So they're not managing this well at all. And mm -hmm. I don't believe that we're going to be on a, on a trajectory that's going to save us from what's coming. So the only really choice that you have, if you care about this and, and you, you see the world as, as a threat and these things that are happening as a threat, is you have to take actions yourself and yeah. you have to protect your family in that way. And so food, great, 90 days, 100 days, and I think it's just prudent at this point anyway, <laughs> yeah. given what's going on in the world. You don't even have to be one of those crazy conspiracy theorists anymore. No. That just makes sense. It's math. <laughs> but but how do you how how does having gold and silver help when you know everyone's there's chaos like you said two reasons the first and the most basic is remember this is an intermediary right so gold is for larger purchases i want to buy a tractor as an example all you know a billion dollars in in canadian that's you know hyperinflated is worthless or i can't get it out of the bank if there's a run on the bank or something well i've got this gold coin we take a gold coin yeah sure whatever at least i can use that for something else so remember that the point of currency and the point of money is an intermediary between resources you and resources that somebody else will agree to accept most people will accept silver because it's the best and closest thing to money so right right after the collapse you still want cash right if you believe that's going to happen so cash is still king until people believe that it's not right but gold and silver are always going to be something that are an intermediary intermediary between things that you need and want yeah. and the second then then the the other part of that is the next step so if we're able to rebuild after the collapse of the canadian currency as an example if that was going to happen and your options are central bank digital currency and something else well what is that other what is that other thing that's either gold and silver or hard assets and barter that's it you have three options, which is central bank digital currency, cash, and barter. And if you don't, if you can't use cash and you don't want to use barter, the only intermediary between that is gold and silver. That that's the hard reality of what human civilization has looked like for human civilization. You have something that you have, and I have something that that um, I have. We either trade for those things, or we have an intermediary that you can go and use for something else. That's how the economy works. And because we've been conditioned for so long to use cash, or now digital cash, because most people don't even use cash anymore, right? If that changes to central bank digital currencies, most people will accept that. I think most people will accept that because they don't know the risk. They don't know what's happening with it. But if you don't want to use in that system, and I hope most people that watch this don't because it's it's basically slavery, um, you have to have another option. And if that option is the bank and all of your money is in the bank, what if you can't get your money out of the bank? That's literally happening all over the world right now. In China, you can't get your money out. They're trying to do the same thing in Australia right now. Um, and they're, they're going for digital IDs too. And what the digital IDs and what, what they showed us over COVID is if they have the control over you and your digital ID, they can just remove you from society. And so you still have to have an ability, ability to transact outside of that system that is totally in your control. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of options to do that. And uh, that's likely the reason that the central banks are tra accumulating gold and silver right now, because oh. they see the value in it. I forgot to mention that. So um, so just to give you um, a... Um, 
a context for for the amount of gold that's out there. So it's generally considered true that the U.S. has around 8,000 tons of gold. We don't actually know if they do, and there's there's evidence that they don't, but we'll, we'll just say that they do. China has, you know, theoretically somewhere in the neighborhood of like 5,000 tons of gold. Well, central banks last year and and um, this year they're on track for about the same. They last year they bought about 1,100 tons of gold, right? Wow. That's billions of dollars of gold. And I think I think now this is my personal speculation that what they're going to do is they're going to say when all of the sovereign currencies collapse, they're going to be like, hey, you guys really screwed up because you don't have a gold-backed currency. But we're smart and prudent, and we knew this was coming because they're creating the situation. They're like, hey, we got all the gold, and now that we have this central bank digital currencies that's backed by gold, you can rest assured that your money is safe with us <laughs> they're great salesmen hey i know they're genius and so there's this thing called the hegelian dialect that's you know from way back in the day that's essentially like hey if i create the problem and I, then i give you the solution that's good for me and you accept it even if you beg for it everybody wins right yeah. but it's essentially it's essentially um social engineering that they're like hey I have this goal and the way to get it is to create this problem so that you have this solution that you need to take to get to the goal that I have. I don't tell you about my goal and I don't tell you that I'm creating the problem, but I'm going to give you the solution after you feel the problem that I created for you. Yeah. Well, I'm so, so happy that we were able to have this conversation because I learned so much about it. Like I had ideas and inklings about some of these things, but you really helped um, clear it up. And it goes to what I'm all about is helping to empower Canadians and help them understand what's really governing them, how they're being governed and what they can do to mm -hmm. help themselves. And I'm really excited to now be affiliated with New World Precious Metals. Um, I think obviously there's a great benefit to being prepared and being prudent given what is going on not just in our country but around our around the world and it you it doesn't take a rocket scientist <laughs> uh to understand that we need to be prepared for anything really at this point yeah um so if i could just leave off on, on yes. one kind of core thing that i like to leave people with so the, the, uh, I'll, I'll just be really honest with you and everybody else okay we we are in for some really tough times okay so the, there's a lot of problems in the world that i haven't even touched on the majority of them <laughs> you guys kind of just went, went where you took me but there beyond what we talked about today there is an infinite amount of other problems that we face and the people that are supposed to represent us and the people that are supposed to solve these problems are not so what does that leave? That leaves you, me, and everybody that gives a shit about our country and our and our society and our community. We have to be the people to take responsibility for this because nobody's come to save us, right? So the thing that I like to impart on people is you are in a physical community with physical people that have a physical requirement. That's why I like to talk about food. If you're in a city, you, you are, are, are food negative. You have to import food into that city for everybody to survive in that city, right? And so this is why I like to tell people, if you care about any of the stuff that I talked about today, you have to have a group that you are physically involved with in your physical community to try and prepare for this stuff because nobody is going to survive what's coming alone, right? You have to have the skills, assets, and resources that are going to keep you and your family alive and safe. And the amount of stuff that our government is doing to us and the amount of stuff that's happening around the world, it's not good. And it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And we have to prepare for that. Well, I, I, that's a great description. And like, you know, when you pick your team, how many Canadians will be like, I would like Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland to be there Nobody. when things are bad. <laughs> exactly. Like, let's just be honest and real about it. Yeah. They haven't helped our country this far, thus far. We've only seen it gone downhill and we're, it's, we're in an uncomfortable place. So yes, I like how you said that. Find some people resources things that you work with and you want to be affiliated with so yeah. thank you so much for that um I'm, i'll have a link at the bottom of this to uh the affiliate program is there anything else you want to say about new world precious metals uh where to sure. find you, anything like that yeah, yeah. Look, I forgot to complain. Forgot to touch on that. New World Precious Metals has been in Canada for for a good eight years. The guy that owns the company, a really good guy, has been in precious metals for like thirty years. The the we work with Quest Trade. We work with um, a company called Precious Metals International. They've been in Canada for like thirty years, um, and we can help people get um, physical precious metals into their hand, into their portfolio, or protect them, uh, help protect their retirement with like RSPs and stuff like that. We can get you all into precious metals in various different ways. So if anybody's interested in anything of the stuff that I said today, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, Bryce Wade, B-E-O, uh, at 
Braceway BEO, click on the link and get connected to us and we'll help you out. So one of, one of the things that we really like to do is is we we see all these problems coming. And so we know that precious metals is a, is a very valuable part of protecting your family's wealth and portfolio. And, and you should generally have between, you know, 10 to 20 percent of your net wealth in precious metals as a hedge against everything else. Silver's up 30 percent this year. Gold's up 100 percent in the last seven years. And um, for, remember when I was talking about the gold standard that we got off of in 1971 from 1971 yeah. to 1980 gold 10x and silver 12x and so we're really at the beginning of what we think is 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 going to happen in this cycle so i think there's a huge opportunity for people um to protect their wealth and and and, and do what needs to be done and, it, and it's not the prudent. only option yeah and be prudent because our government isn't. Yeah, is not <laughs> yeah absolutely okay well so that thank was you so great. much for the opportunity my pleasure. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll just be on in a few minutes with um, for the paid Twitter subscribers. Uh, but thank you. That was excellent, excellent education on uh, economy and preparing ourselves. So thanks, Bryce. My pleasure.